after a little bit of review, we learn and learn some new things. There aren't any learn from order. 37. I am her. This girl was 18, goes to Big City, and congratulations. You <laughs> shouldn't have. Okay. So, blah, blah, blah. She's missing her menstrual cycle. Okay. You're nine weeks in the pregnancy. So, why isn't she menstruating? What's the magic three letters? HCG. Alright, HCG is what prohibits you from menstruating. Remind me where it's made on your question just there. No, HCG is not made in the ovaries. By the embryo. And when is that made? Starts at fertilization. Basically starts early, early, you know, early pregnancy. Probably week three-ish on. So HCG is overriding her corpus luteum and telling it to maintain progesterone. So remember this one from last week? What are they testing for in the pregnancy test? HCG. That's right. ABT equals HCG. So she went to the doctor. The embryo is cranking out HCG, and therefore it's showing up on her pee. Right? Make sense? That's kind of review. Now we're going to get to the lab results. Okay, blood pressure is slightly elevated, no protein, uh, gestational hypertension, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so let's figure out number three. I need some non preferred hormones that make you feel bloated with high blood pressure. Ah! <gasps> Sorry. Aldosterone would be the best choice. Let's review for your final what aldosterone does. Aldosterone does what? Reabsorb sodium. If I keep more sodium in my body, I'm going to attract more water. More water raises my blood pressure. That's the rash you learned last term, right? It's also going to make me bloated in my ECF. So her body's increasing aldosterone. Why would we Good question. Um, kind of trivia. Every muscle cycle you do this. That's why you get bloated during your muscle cycle. It is the RAS system cranks up to increase blood pressure. And the weird logic is it happens before you menstruate. So what the logic is, is that the body realizes you're going to bleed and lose pressure. So I crank your pressure ahead of time. And when you bleed, you go back to normal. So you're anticipating blood loss. When you're pregnant, you're going to have a lot of blood loss, but you need high pressure to beat the placenta. So your body's ramping up pressure to maintain perfusion to placenta plus maintaining blood loss. Now, how's it going to do that? It's me. It's measurable in the first trimester, but I don't know exactly what day it starts to come up. Like you'll start getting the bloated feeling early on in the first trimester. This is what I'm saying. So, let's do number four then. She does not have any protein in her pee. Tell me from lab what that means. It's good. Yes, good. Because what would happen if there was protein in her pee? That means I'm letting big stuff through, right? So I shouldn't have big things in my urine. So not having protein in my urine, that's a good sign. All right. So all that means is that she has high blood pressure, but she isn't forcing big stuff into her feet. Right? But does that, that sometimes happens in pregnancy? It can. Right? And you can end up with, remember from that, the non-pathological pregnancy. Right. right? But in this case, she doesn't have any of that. So what would have been a concern in the UA? So not just in this case, but what things would doctors think that would have said bad? So glucose could have been in your MP. Let's go through each one. What's bad about having glucose in your pee? Right, you're not using sugar, so that'd be gestational diabetes, right? Which happens to a lot of women. Right? We'll talk about why that is in a minute. A little later. So it could be glucose in your pee, that'd be a word red flag. They always, right? If you're pregnant, they always gonna be drink the solution and test your pee. What else might be in your and that would be bad if you're pregnant? Or at least what is it? Well, blood, we could RBC is always bad. Maybe WBCs, right? Infections. What else? What else do diabetics throw in their pee? Ketones. ketones. So you could have ketones, which means you're burning fat. Nitrites. Nitrites would be like a WBC, yes. So nitrites. So all the 
stuff you did in the lab, if those start appearing in the urine, that means you're gestational diabetic, you have filtration problems, you have a UTI, you're burning your fat, all those would be problematic in pregnancy. But protein can be normal. It's a non pathological source. So let's do Amber's question. So here she is in week nine. Let's see her. All the moral gymnastics. The baby's not really formed yet. Okay, let's, let's educate Amber. Let's form by week nine. Oh, yes. All the organs, right? So the internal organs. Right? That doesn't mean your external organs. That means the inside plumbing, the wiring. So, ninth week, what are you, say ye? Yes. Congratulations, you're a fetus. Because by definition, week nine is when you end organogenesis. And by definition, that's when we throw the word at you. Okay. Right? Make sense? Um, protein, when pregnant protein could get through? Uh, because the pressure goes up. Right, so the increased pressure is like standing on your macaroni. You can force some through the colander so that the pressure climbs, you will get some protein spilling through the filtration. We have an increase in protein from, yes. from the baby and all that? Yes. Okay. So, but that's usually secondary to the pressure. Okay, so the pressure is the main cause. That's non pathological gestational hypertension or denuria. How's that going? Right. Now, the great red X. What reproductive hormones will begin to increase in Amber's body if she maintains her pregnancy? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's a bunch of videos to show you about that. Okay? So we're going to walk through some pregnancy videos, not the gory ones you just saw. This is the kind of biological one. So here we have mom, right? There's baby. Let's a significant role in triggering changes in the mother and fetus. It's all about the hormones. Hormones maintain the lining of the uterus and prevent menstruation. Yep. Prepare mammary glands for lactation. Yep. Increase flexibility of the pubic symphysis. You bet. Induce changes in the metabolism of the mother to enhance growth of the fetus. And play a role in determining the timing of birth. You got it. We're going to do each of those. <laughs> right. Click on the overview. Where are you? Very crammed down baby's kind of slide there. During the first week after fertilization, kind of the ovarian corpus luteum continues to secrete hormones that are essential to maintain the normal female reproductive cycle. Jamie, how's it going to be that? Tender. Right, so this is week one of them, right? The corpus luteum's already there. So this isn't an HCG thing, this is my normal corpus luteum. I'm, hot, I'm ovulated, I get two weeks of corpus luteum before I have to worry about it. So during week one, if you're ready to implant, there you are over there, you're still floating around. The corpus luteum is just doing its every day job. You're just making progesterone, making estrogen, you're a happy uterus. I don't have to worry about the whole HCG thing until the corpus luteum begins to go away. So week one is most After the blastocyst embeds in the endometrium, it secretes human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG. So now, once they're implanted, they're going to start yelling at the corpus luteum that I don't want you to flush me. Right? Human chorionic gonadotropin prevents the ovarian corpus luteum from degenerating so that it can continue to secrete estrogen and progesterone which act to maintain the nourishing secretions of the endometrial lining. Because the levels of progesterone and estrogen are maintained, menstruation does not occur. Yep. Human chorionic gonadotropin is detectable in the blood and urine of a pregnant woman as early as eight days following fertilization. Right, so if you get the really expensive $100 doctor test, they can test it about a week or so in. You go to the KR and get five for dollar test, that's not going to happen. Right? That's going to test way further out. So the top, they're, they're all testing the same thing. The level of the blood determines how sensitive the test is. So the more expensive the test, the sooner it can read the level. Because you go back to the graph, right? It, it does climb immediately after fertilization, but the time that we really see it hit is about three weeks in. That's when it's really, really high. So your typical over-the-counter one will tell you, what's the only have a week after your first menstruation? They kind of that was a lot. You had two weeks of menstruation, until menstruation, and a week after, and then you can tell you're pregnant. But the really expensive ones can be before you miss your menstrual period. Makes sense? Not uh, how expensive. But really, they're all testing the same thing. It's just how quickly they can pick up this surge. Okay. 
What the trivia? If you look at the graph, this is totally not real trivia. If you're nine months along, really cheap tests will say you're not pregnant. Because they need a really high level to be taxed. So you could take one at nine months and have it be negative. Right? Because the levels are high enough still for it to register. The doctor will know. But the you know, eight for dollars for kind of thing probably would not. They sold my dog here. They sold my dog here? Really? For a dollar? <laughs> there you go. Right. 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 But anyways, that's just the logic. So sensitivity to the test is what's most suited to be confined. Not the hormone assessment. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Last During the first three months of pregnancy, estrogen and progesterone are secreted primarily by the corpus luteum. These hormones act to maintain nutritional support for the embryo and fetus. HCG production increases, peaking at eight weeks. The presence of this hormone prevents degeneration of the corpus luteum, which is producing ever-increasing levels of estrogen and progesterone. Maximum estrogen and progesterone production shifts from the corpus luteum to the placenta during the ninth week. And we mentioned that in last week, that the corpus luteum actually is not required much of the placenta. And they're doing their gas flow just from here. Right? But once I have the placenta, as we mentioned a little bit, now I'm going to start cranking out the same two hormones, just different location. So we're going to start filling in our case study. Let's go back to that. Remember, hey, you're going to make a big, big five page, you're going to need it. We're going to start listening to our hormones, and just go back to the video. <laughs> So let's start listing the hormones we've done so far. Other than HCG. So we have progesterone and estrogen. We'll do that. Main thing. I know. I'm waiting for it. I knew you were going to say it. The minute I read it. Why did you do it then? People wonder why I come out of letter reference that says stuff. <laughs> Always sits in the front row and doesn't know where her charger is. <gasps> Too soon. Right. So what were the hormones again? We had progesterone and estrogen are two of them. will be more. Okay, now the important part is where they come from. So where are these made? So H Corpus luteum. Is one of the choices, and that's early in pregnancy. And then it's made where else? The placenta. And that's later in pregnancy. So, well, yeah, but yes, in fact, too. So, like week seven on. So, here's the trick when you're reading through your book, they'll mention. Ovarian progesterone, and then they'll all sense a placental progesterone. All they're meaning is it went from the corpus luteum making it to the placenta making it. There's no difference in the hormone, it's where the source is. Make sense? So, what is the job of progesterone? Remind me again. Yeah. Masculinity. Maintain the corpus luteum. I'm sorry, maintain the endometrium. Devascularize, right? So, it doesn't matter where it's coming from, your ovaries or your placenta, it's still doing the same job, maintaining the pregnancy. Estrogen, where does it come from? Corpus luteum. Again, early in pregnancy. And placental. So again, you'll read about ovarian estrogen, and then a paragraph later, solenoid into placental estrogen. Same thing. The only difference is which body parts are making the hormone. What's the job of estrogen? To grow and increase the thickness All of the All right, so the growing endometrium. This is endometrium, it's the word script. We understood it to grow in the first uh, part of the cycle. So is it still kind of growing? Um, it just maintains at this point. Okay. All right. It's just like a kind of The other thing, if you remember way back when, estrogen is part of just maintaining your female reproductive and secondary sex characteristics. 
maintaining body fat, right, all that kind of stuff. Wait, estrogen comes from corpus luteum too, not just the... Yes, they can. Okay. We just talked about the progesterone part. Okay. So your ovaries and your placenta are making both of these hormones, and those are helping maintain basically the, the pregnancy early on. So you have placental and ovarian, estrogen and placental and ovarian, progesterone. Oh wait, there's more, because we're not quite done yet. Not even close. After the fourth month of pregnancy, levels of HCG decrease significantly and stay at a low level. Following the fourth month, rising levels of placental estrogen and progesterone are sufficient to maintain the pregnancy. All right, so that's what they did there, right? My HCG goes away at some point, so my corpus luteum turns off, but my placenta is on, so my placenta is still going, so my levels keep going up. That's why this picture, the levels kept standing even though ACG went down. The placenta is developing and then cranking out these hormones throughout the next pregnancy. So once I have a placenta, I don't need HCG. So if you look at this graph, you look at the peak HCG and go down. That's the last time that you needed it because now I have a placenta from that point forward, cranking out these hormones in big levels. Right, that's why it goes down. So control, as we say, control shifts the placenta. The placenta is now running your pregnancy. Right, let's keep going. There's more. Click on your placenta. At this stage, the placenta is now the primary source of pregnancy hormones. These hormones include estrogen, progesterone, relaxin, human chorionic somatomammotropin, <laughs> and corticotropin releasing hormones. <laughs> okay, we're going to put that system over here, because that's the rest of them that we're going to talk about. So we already did estrogen and progesterone over there. Right, now we're going to complete the list over here. So we have relaxin onwards. Let's put the list over here. So we're going to have another hormone, is relaxin, which we learned in 231. Well, let's review it, number three. Where is it made according to this? Placenta. 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 You'll never forget that now. You'll never forget it. Like So my placenta, your placenta, is now making this hormone. Okay, so you have to go back to 231. What's the job of relaxin? Separate your poops and it weakens cartilage. <laughs> hey, remind me why pregnant. We saw a gross video about it. Why would you want weak cartilage? So that your pubic can So they can bend your bones apart to get a baby out. So I'm going to weaken the cartilages that are holding your joints together. So the placenta is telling the mom's body to weaken the cartilage right, in preparation for childbirth. Okay, let's do another one. We'll I'll show you a video on that one later. So we got that one. All right, human chorionic, you gotta love that word, somatomammotropin. Is that just HCS? <laughs> yes. Thank you. So, HCG, we got rid of this HCS. Now, the older word for this, when I was a lad, we called this lactogen. So you'll still read in books about lactogen. That's the same thing, but why make it one word when you can use three with more syllables? Right. Let's see if you can figure this out. Somatomammotropin. Tropin hormones do what? Act on. Act on mammo. Memory okay. glands. Somato, the body of them. So literally, going to make your boobs' bodies grow. Right. Literally is what that says. So it's lactogen. So where's that coming from? Placenta. placenta. So again, placental HCS. The last one for our list is number five. That one, corticotropin releasing. So the job of HCS is to replace your memory backs grow. Basically, yes. I'll show you a whole video on that. Not that particularly. Right. Well, I guess I could. Right. Corticotropin-releasing hormone. So we go 
see this one abbreviated CRS, that's the template CRS. Same thing, just a little different. So, where's this made? Placenta. It's against a placental hormone. Let's figure out what releasing hormones do. What do releasing hormones do? They tell you to release, release something. So I'm going to release a corticotropic hormone. So corticotropics go to my where? What? Adrenal, Adrenal cortex to turn them on. So I'm going to activate my adrenal cortex. So each of these has a video I'm going to show you to fill in the details. So this is a list of the major <laughs> pregnancy hormones. Wait, what happened to HCG and placental? Which one? Oh, those are part of this list as well? The HCG? Yes. Uh, YCG was original, but then those two and then these. Okay, but there's really one about the hormones on the list. The HCG and the Cosmic Pattern. Yeah, what did you talk about from last week? Yeah, I wanted to talk about last week. Are they over there? And there were. No. Yeah, the HCG was. Yes, we did. So, the next one is HCG? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 High levels of both estrogen and progesterone inhibit the formation of breast milk. We'll talk about that a little later. Progesterone inhibits myometrial contractions of the uterus to prevent premature birth. So, the, the one and two over there are going to basically maintain your endometrium, keep blood going to it, keep it from contracting, it's called the calming hormones, right? So, it's to maintain the pregnancy. And we'll talk a little later about milk. They can actually turn off your milk ability, which is interesting. Right? But basically, one and two are maintaining the endometrium and keeping your pregnancy going, which are right up there. But now, we have some more. Relaxin. Relaxin inhibits myometrial contractions of the uterus. It also contributes to preparations for birth by stimulating increased flexibility of the symphysis pubis. So again, if I want to get the baby out of there, I can be able to part those bones a little bit easier. So hence, relax this to relax the chest. You said it inhibits contractions? Yes. So this also helps reduce the ability of the uterus to contract spontaneously. Oh, okay. So it's not the, it's not the main one for birth, but it's just one more factor that reduces the, st increases the stability of the uterus. Is that, is relaxing um, effect that? Locally, or is that all of the all cartilages? That's why you wonder why your foot size change when you're pregnant. Mm -hmm. Your feet go flat because the relaxing makes your arches go down, so your feet elongate. Mm -hmm. Then, when you give birth, the relaxing goes away, you reseal up the new position. So your foot size changed after pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Does that. It doesn't go back. It doesn't go back. As a rule, you can. Your bones don't go back. So, you have bigger hips after You have bigger hips and bigger feet. I'm not like you know, like pound feet or something, right? I'm not that much money. The size changes. Right? And okay, I'm relaxing. So, meat gets cartilages. Let's keep going. Click on the set. Now, a lot of these ones. Human chorionic somatomanotropin, or HCF, enhances maternal breast growth by increasing protein synthesis. What? Human chorionic somatomammotropin, also called human placental lactogen, prepares the mammary glands for lactation. Human chorionic somatomammotropin increases the use of fatty acids for maternal production of ATP, leaving more glucose available for the fetus. This hormone also acts to make maternal cells insulin resistant reducing the use of glucose by the mother's cells. As such, more glucose remains in the maternal blood and becomes available for the fetus. Okay, so 
We'll scrap those bounds and give a little special side note for HCS. Which again, you can call lactogen. I'm okay with lactogen. I like lactogen. We'll see. All right, so let's review what it did. What did it do again? Prepares memory glands. You wonder why your breasts grow all pregnant? This is the reason they grow. Because you're getting the mammary glands to the division. We used to call this priming the pump. But only farmers know what that means, right? So you're trying to get the system up and running. But in addition, what's it do to blood sugar? Yeah, it increases maternal blood sugar. Is that by decreasing? Does that have to do with the um, insulin receptors? Yeah. Yes, receptors. this down regulates insulin receptors. Okay. And so, that would to have a that kind of gestational diabetes. Yeah, that is why you're diabetic. So you wonder why your gestational diabetes is basically that. So think about from a baby's point of view. Why does a baby want mom diabetic? So I get the sugar from you, right? So the whole the placenta is trying to force your body as a woman to give blood sugar to the baby. Otherwise, if you ran a race, baby wouldn't get any sugar, right? Your muscles would burn it all. So it kind of makes sense. The placenta doesn't want you to burn your sugar. It wants to save the sugar for the baby. You get to burn the fat instead. But the sugar goes baby. So you become insulin resistant. So the baby guarantees it gets blood sugar every time, all the time. Yes? So what do you do to treat that during pregnancy? Do you have to do anything? Well, I mean, part of it's just genetic. Um, doctors will tell you to have a low sugar diet like a regular diabetic. Just eat less sugar, you got force it to buy it less. In um, theory, exercise is good. I mean, sometimes it just is. That's why they're constantly going to have you pee in a cup during pregnancy, is they're checking this. And also, they tend to give you birth, they force you to have birth earlier usually, it reduces the baby size. Right? So the more sugar you eat, the more sugar the baby gets, the bigger the baby grows. Yeah. That's gestational diabetes, the placenta overruling your insulin. Wow. Okay. Wait, so you were saying that HCS is also called lactogen? Yeah, that's another. That's the older word for it. Placenta lactogen. Okay. And so, so it's either one that we can we can quote. Or, yeah, okay. that's one I actually know better in my head than Corey, I mean, Corey and Corey Somato Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, so let's do where we're at now. Click on placenta. Next one. Corticotropin releasing hormone from the placenta stimulates the fetal anterior pituitary gland to secrete adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH. Let's review that again. Remember, releasing hormones go to your pituitary. Remember that from 232? And tell your pituitary to talk to the worker. So the CRH from the placenta is acting like a hypothalamus. It's going to the baby's anterior pituitary to make ACTH. So CRH is going to increase ACTH in the fetus. Right. So now you have to go back to that chart from hell from last term that you're going to remember as good nursing students. ACTH went to adrenal cortex and turned on what hormones? Karen crickets. Aldosterone. Aldosterone is one, mineral corticoids, glucocorticoids, and adrenal androgens, right? All the adrenal corticoids. So the placenta is telling the baby's adrenal cortex to turn on, basically. So let's watch that happen. TTH stimulates the fetal adrenal gland to secrete cortisol which is required for fetal lung maturation and the production of surfactant before birth. Placental corticotropin releasing hormone levels increase greatly toward the end of the pregnancy and stimulate the fetus and the placenta to produce more estrogen. In okay, so let's look at that again. CRH from the placenta is telling who to make more estrogen. The baby, right? Because your adrenal gland makes sex hormones. So, in addition to mom making estrogen and progesterone, and the placenta making estrogen and progesterone, the baby now is cranking on estrogen. Right? So, the placenta is bringing everybody in town basically to make estrogen. So, the baby makes it, mom's body is basically cranking it out because of the CRH ACTH system. If you go back a little bit, Human chorionic, 
Corticotropin releasing hormone from the placenta stimulates the fetal anterior pituitary gland to secrete adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH. ACTH stimulates. That's what I want. Remember cortisone, cortisol, how is a glucocorticoid? What's the job of glucocorticoid? It does what? In your body. Why do you take cortisone shots? <laughs> it's a steroid. It stops inflammation and also increases glucose, right? Fight or flight response. So think of it. Why would a baby want more blood sugar? The same concept. Right? So again, we're trying to re reproducing some of this glucose thing. Not only am I getting glucose by turning off mom's blood sugar receptors, but I'm making my own sugar hit my body. So you're getting a lot of cortico action, right? in addition to the fetal lung and all that. Right? So if we keep playing along here. Adrenal gland to secrete cortisol, which is required for fetal lung maturation and the production of surfactant before birth. And that's on your final page. Placental corticotropin releasing hormone levels increase greatly toward the end of the pregnancy and stimulate the fetus and the placenta to produce more estrogens. Increased levels of estrogen act as a timer for birth and preparation for lactation. Right? So the thinking goes is pure speculation. No one knows, right? But as estrogen climbs higher and higher, at some point, the uterus thinks it's time for birth. Because baby's cranked it out, son's cranked it out. How it knows that? No one knows, right? The uterus just says, hey, today's the day. Right. So do you want to give birth? Should we do birth? Let's do birth. Okay. Yes. So, sorry, I just wanted to recap. So yeah. the baby's ACTH is higher now, yep. which is going to increase their sex hormones, their yes. corticoids, and their glucocorticoids. Yes. But that's part about what glucocorticoids do. So what are the in what's the purpose of the increased sex hormones and the increased mineral corticoids? So sex hormones are also to maintain mom's pregnancy, also for your genitals. So it's sex hormones. Penal. Sex hormones yep. that maintain the mom's pregnancy? Yes. They add to it. And then what about genitalia? Mineral corticoids. Uh, salt retention. So blood pressure. So I'm not going to let go of my water, so mom gets to dehydrate that out. Okay. So in some ways, you're competing with your baby for the same resources. You close the apple under the tree effect, right? This sounds silly, but if you're an apple and you're underneath mom, you die because mom's taking your light, taking your water. So the only way you can survive as an apple is have someone eat you and haul you up. Well, as a mammal, you can't do that. So you have to bring her body to not take the things you want. So you steal her glucose, you steal her salt, you steal all this other stuff so she can't get it. Right? Otherwise, she'd kill you. Can I see the last bullet point on the previous? Uh, the milk one? Human chorionic somatomastrophin, or HCS, enhances maternal breast growth by increasing protein synthesis. Human chorionic somatomammotropin, also called human placental lactogen, prepares the mammary glands for lactation. Human chorionic somatomammotropin increases the use of fatty acids for maternal production of ATP, leaving more glucose available for the fetus. This hormone also acts to make which yeah. Okay. So mom is insulin resistant, she can't use sugar, so baby can steal it. Okay. Make sense? So before we go into the birth thing, let's talk about this placenta thing. We mentioned it last week, we mentioned it now. Yes. Um, one last thing, sure. so we can repeat the, um, what is, so the androgen help for the general development, what does yes. it do for the mom? Yeah. Uh, add to the maintenance of pregnancy, some more estrogen. You get that pregnancy flow, all that stuff that estrogen added. So baby's estrogen acts the same as yours. So let me show you this picture. This sounds, this is a bizarre picture. Okay. The green thing's a baby actor, right? So we're half now, right? Here's baby, like you learned in one now. And here's the umbilical cord, which you learned in lab, right? And here's that placenta thing we talked about. So here's a close-up of the placenta. So
So let's review this red stuff back here. What is this? Where is that? Who is that? That's mom. That's mom Juniors, right? This is endometrial tissue, right? This red and blue stuff, that's what? Fingers? That's blood. That's the cardiovascular. The fingers. Whose blood is that? It says fetal capillaries. It says baby's blood, right? So if you look in this picture, blood's coming down your little cord, your belly button. And it kind of comes out and then basically heads down into mom's uterus, the individual lining, and looks just like this. And then, why would I want baby blood inside of uterus? I mean, what's the point of that? Read the big word with D, and I'm going to scream it for that. <laughs> Bam! Okay, so remind me from college 112 what diffusion means. High to low concentration. High to low, more or less. So, who has the auction? Baby blood mom? Baby lung, nobody. Oh. Mom. So, if there's more diffusion, there's oxygen in her uterus. It's going to go from uterine tissue, endometrial tissue, into fetal capillaries. So, they're deoxygenating going to the endometrium, and they're oxygenating coming back. Who has more glucose? Mom's blood or baby's blood? Mom, because she's not able to use it, therefore it's going to go from high uterus to low fetal. Okay? Who has more waste? Really rapid fire metabolism, baby or sluggish mom? Baby. So baby has a lot of urea and CO2 that's going to go from fetal capillaries back into endometrium. So there's a big exchange in it, right? That's what's happening, is you're simply swapping who has more and who has less. So the placenta is making mom keep a high amount of things, so the diffusion will force it into the baby's bloodstream, so baby now gets the glucose and the oxygen. Right? And you receive all the waste the baby has. Make sense? So I'm going to show you an animation just of the placenta. Give me just a second to bring up this. Formally, 
It's operating, it's running week three. What are you at week three again? Embryo. You're an embryo. So when you are an embryo, you also have a placenta. You have this exchange system. To show you that I'm not making this up, but let me show you a picture I already showed you. I have this on it, but you didn't quite catch it because I didn't actually point it out. Okay. Let me show you this picture here, which is. Okay. So you look at this picture, here you are, embryo. If you notice, you have this, this little, it's kind of going to be grainy, but notice that little bit of tissue right there. You have an umbilical cord, and there's a little thing growing here and here. What is that? That's going to be the placenta. So you start seeing a placenta roughly week three. To prove that I'm not making this up much. So back here. So here again, I've just planted. I don't really have a placenta per se. I have things that will be a placenta. Here I am at day nine ish. I still don't really have a placenta. Here I am day 16, I'm getting closer and closer to having a placenta. Right? So as I'm growing these fingers out, I'm getting more and more contact with mom's endometrium. Eventually, we're going to call that a placenta at week three. Right? But that's where I'm going to grow into mom and start stealing everything from her. So if you don't have a placenta at week one, how do you stay alive? You're so close yeah. already to the next yeah. issue. That's not really how we eat a Yeah, so if you think about it, remember biology 112, a cell has all those things inside it, right? Your storage granules, you have water. So the first two weeks of your life, you're relying on all these cells just to stay alive. You're not stealing anything from mom. They're all self-supported. And then being week three, you're going to start replacing everything you burn from mom. So you're on your own for two weeks, roughly, before mom's body begins to gestate you. So tell me why you have to go through like cleavage just to get more cells, the cells that have more fluids that you can use, more mitochondria, all those things. So in addition to the joy of pregnancy, it's amazing you're alive for two weeks with nothing to help you. And then week three, you can start stealing it all back. Was the yolk sac a part of the Yeah, we don't use the yolk sac for that, though. Okay, because I actually don't know what it does. Yeah, so in a chicken, that'd be true. A chick burns the yolk to stay alive, but we don't. We just make a little cord out of it. Is that all it does? Yeah. So where's this chicken? I think I have that. Yeah. So then we're dividing cells to create more... More surface area just to basically uh, survive. So here you are, four and a half weeks. You have a yolk sac. We're going to use it for food. We're using the placenta now to gain food. That becomes your normal food. What happens to the yolk sac? You absorb it, it becomes part of your belly button. Yeah, so it just fuses and puts a membrane right there on the milk cord. So if you're a chick, you keep it. If we're not a chick, we don't. We're meant for the centrals. We just reabsorb it and make it a milk cord. So you have a yolk sac. You just don't use it for yolk. So you don't use it for nutrients? No. It's a mom's cord. Right. So over the evolutionary path, that's kind of what happens is if you have a mom placenta, you don't need all this other stuff. So I just steal it from her. Better system. So this area where the yolk sac is meeting the veins yep. and arteries, it yep. just yep. kind of comes together. Yep. And then and that it goes away. So here you are. Here's the placenta. Here's your belly button. And there's the yolk sac just kind of it degrades, basically. That's uh, part of this little... Wait, could you point to those one more time? Yolk sac. Sure. Yolk sac. So the yolk sac's here. And that's the placenta. And then here's the placenta, this big thing here. And when does it degrade? It brings your health frequency, but it basically goes away once you get placenta. So let's go back to my little magic code. What was I doing? So we need to know about the yolk sac. You just said it. Yeah, so let's go back there. We're still going to spin. So week three, placenta. Let's magnify this area so you can see what we're talking about. Okay. That's a good thing. Here, you see a vein and an artery from the embryo in yep. close contact with the blood in the mother's uterine lining. Are they actually hooked together? No. Say no. 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 Yeah, so a very common misconception people have is you're clumping, you know, clumping baby's blood through your butt. That doesn't work. You go back to 232, there'd be no way to pump two people's blood with two separate parts in any way, right? You'd never be able to coordinate. So they're always separate. Baby's blood is over here. Mom's blood's over there, and they do not ever, ever, ever meet, right? They're just next to each other. So I'm stealing from her, and she's stealing from me, but we don't actually mix blood. Right? 
because if you think about that, it's probably an immune reaction problem or all that other stuff. So they're just next to each other. Inside the blood vessels, you can also see red blood cells, which carry oxygen. The two blood streams are separated by a thin collection of tissues in the placenta called the blood barrier. This barrier permits small particles, like nutrients and oxygen, to pass from the mother to the embryo. And allows waste products to pass from the embryo back to the mother. So if this were an alveolar or respiratory membrane, what characteristics would you tell me on your final exam are good for getting gas to pass in and out of your bloodstream to the lungs? Thin, thin, large surface area, moist, right? That's exactly the same characteristics of this one, right? It's a thin barrier, there's water, it's moist, it's a big surface area, because you're doing basically the same thing, crossing from mom to baby through an air sac, basically. And that's what your percent is for. All these concepts. The blood barrier right also prevents many large or potentially harmful particles from entering the embryo's bloodstream. Notice that the red blood cells do not cross from the mother's bloodstream to the embryos. You may be wondering how a mother's blood cells could be harmful to a growing baby and why it's important to keep the two bloodstreams separate. If the mother's blood type is negative and her embryo's blood type is positive, then the mother's blood cells would treat the embryo as an invading foreign organism and try to destroy it. Now you can see why the placenta and its blood barrier are important for supplying the growing embryo with nutrition and oxygen, removing its waste products, and preventing harmful substances from getting into its bloodstream. Makes sense. So that structure that does the exchange is also cranking up these hormones. Yes. So you said the qualities would be like thin, large surface area, lots of fluid. Are you talking about the placenta itself? Yes. Okay. The, the blood barrier of the placenta, not the blood barrier structure, but the, or the blood interface. So it transport right. right. back So if I were to put it right on this screen here, that would be this one here. This, this, this distance here is very small. There's a lot of surface area. So that's why it's a finger, a branchy finger. They're thin. Right. It's the most of the tissue, all that stuff they learned in 231 and 2. Right. So that's what the placenta is doing at this point. It's cranking out hormones and cranking out basic exchange. So let's go back to this. So number eight, we just did. We got the five hormones. We'll figure out what they are and where they're being. So on a final exam, if I ask you where the reproductive hormones made for pregnancy, your best answer is always to say what? Placenta. Yes, all of them, right? All of them are made at placenta at some point. So now we're going to figure out number nine. So these, if you're familiar with midwife three and all that, you know these. So, lower doses. Tell me what it is and why pregnant makes you that. It's like a right? back. So why do you walk in a plane and walk over the sway back? Let's find a beat, shall we? So I always thought this this is a fascinating because there's a male like care company that organs can do this, right? A uterus with your not pregnant is the size of your palm. A newborn is the size of your pumpkin. Right? Your uterus can go from hand to pumpkin, go back, do it again, and repeat voluntarily. It's fascinating, isn't it? But now let's put the baby in there like this. So we're going to put a baby, you know, about a foot in front of you, hanging this way. How do you keep your balance if the baby's over there? Okay. You have to it back and keep it really. So as you walk around with more doses, you can keep the baby over your knees so you don't fall forward. Right? So that's the lower doses effect. Somebody's way in front of where you used to be. Make sense? So your job with the rest of your team is going to let you figure out these other bulleted items. We'll talk about them in just a few minutes. See if you can figure out why a pregnancy does colors. So and why we'll talk about it. Yes. Yes. Well, that would be the fourth question we were asking. Should it be done? You can do it. Should you come to the other side? Okay. 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 Okay.